ready. Well, good evening. Welcome to Calvary here tonight. Uh, we are glad to have you worshiping with us uh, Wednesday night. We'll have a little bit of prayer time and we'll get into numbers. I want to do a couple of different uh, pieces out of Numbers chapter 20 and chapter 21. Uh, two different uh, aspects, but a similar message um, of God's in charge. And we need to make sure that, that we recognize who the boss is. Um, and so both of uh, both these passages we'll look at this kind of our our theme of uh, recognizing him. Um, don't have a lot of prayer updates for you. It's been nice a couple of weeks in a row that there's not a whole lot of new stuff, at least not yet. So I sent out a prayer email just minutes uh, after, well, a few, about 6.15 maybe, uh, minutes after 6. Um, and there weren't a whole lot of new updates. I basically updated some items that were already on the prayer list, but, uh, but there wasn't anything super new. Um, the, the one that's listed under new request is uh, Harold and Sharon Gibson's. Uh, Harold's mom and dad have moved in with them. And so uh, just prayer for that transition time. Um, that uh, everybody will settle and they'll be able to work out the caregiving needs uh, and all those kind of things. Um, I was sharing, uh, my father-in-law had a cardio aversion today. So remember Lee, as he uh, kind of recovers from that and gets his feet back under him. He was he was drowsy all afternoon, having a hard time waking up from the anesthesia from, uh, from that. So appreciate prayers for Lee. Elaine's doing about the same. Um, you know, she's... She's there, but she really doesn't know a whole lot of what's going on around her. Uh, she knows who you are, but not a whole lot of interest. Really, is probably more the more the issue than not knowing. It's just kind of takes it as it comes, which is a whole lot better than being combative or some of the other things that could have happened in her in her condition. So, appreciate continued prayers for them. Um, other prayer requests. I we'll do a few praises together. Anybody got other prayer requests or updates? Um, Becky, uh, uh, Alexander, uh, Dottie's uh, granddaughter that's here on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. Uh, she's been sick for a couple of weeks uh, with her chronic condition. And, and just uh, keep her in your prayers for healing, that she'll be able to get back with us um, on a regular basis. She needs that encouragement uh, to be around people and such. So uh, keep Becky in your prayers. And of course, you can keep Dottie in your prayers too. She's in a move transition. Uh, she'll be... Moving to Florida the end of August or end of April, not August, end of April, and so uh, keep Dottie in your prayers. She's been working on finances and mortgages or uh, selling transitions and uh, insurance and all that kind of fun stuff you got to do when you get ready to move. And so uh, keep Dottie in your prayers. She's doing well. She's smiling, and so uh, uh, want to keep 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 God in in control. Um. Any, did you get a chance to talk to Wanda, North Carolina? Okay. Okay. She's transitioned to the nursing home, Wanda Minor, um, for continued care for now. Uh, so keep keep Wanda in your prayers. Uh, and her husband. Okay. He fell while she was in the hospital, so we want to keep keep both of them uh, in prayer for healing. Um, others? David's still doing well. I, I did mention our updated David to has improved well, but continues to need our prayer uh, for healing on his legs. Um, Paul, you still doing well? So... Kind of almost miraculous from one day not able to walk. Well, shouldn't say almost. We think God's in control of this. So um, to, to still not 100%, but a whole lot better than it was. So God praise for that. Other praises. Sun broke through the clouds today for a few minutes. Prior to the rains that are coming. <laughs> It's not April yet. We're getting close. All right. If we don't have any other prayer requests or any other praises, we'll uh, we'll go before the Lord and then we'll get into the scripture. Join me as we pray. 
Father, we thank you uh, again tonight that we can be together in your house. We thank you for these who gather here in person. We thank you for those who watch us online. Uh, we thank you for the technology that makes that possible. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us and reveals to us the reality of who you are, the, the, the permanency of your love, um, who, who, who draws us uh, closer to you each day for those who are willing to, to be drawn, to, who are willing to respond uh, to that uh, calling. I thank you for the truth of your scriptures, your holy word. I thank you for the affirmations uh, that, uh, that, that the Bible is your word and is valid to judge us, to teach us, to protect us, um, to, to guide us. Lord, help us to learn about you, but also to learn to, to, to uh, experience you each day, to know you. In more than just an intellectual way, but in a, in a very real personal way. Help us to serve you. Seeing where you're at work and joining you in the work that you're already doing. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Give us the words uh, to speak. Whatever it would be that you play before us, help us to, to do it well. But we thank you for the healings that have taken place. We thank you for the continued care that you're giving to our sick and needy, our hurting. We ask that you would save the lost and that you would use us to be ministers of the gospel to those who don't know Jesus Christ. Father, tonight as we study your word, grow us into the image you would have us uh, to become, the, into your image, into, into your likeness. Give us more than just truth. Give us application. Lord, help us to, to be more like you each and every day. I thank you for our time again tonight. And so bless this time we have together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, before, uh, before I launch into the scripture, we'll be in Numbers chapter 20 and chapter 21. Um, let me ask you a question that you can, you can help guide me here. Uh, Paul and I are talking about Easter services, so we're we're into April, first Sunday of April. Uh, sunrise, Paul, do you remember what it was? It was about seven forty-five, something like that. And so, um, is that or maybe it was a little earlier even about seven forty-five? So we've talked about a couple of service options, uh, ways to do Easter. So I'm asking for a little feedback here. You can help us, uh, especially if you're part of that eight o'clock crowd. So one of the things we thought about doing was a sunrise service similar to what we did last year. Last year's was online. We don't think or, or expect that we can replicate the cool uh, sunrise backdrop. I mean, yeah, last year was just the perfect day, especially the way the video captured it. But doing something outside, meeting about 7.30 and going, uh, it'll be kind of a communion service similar to last year, about 30 minutes, 45 minutes tops, a couple of songs, short message, communion service. And then maybe having a breakfast prior to Sunday school, maybe from 8.30 to 9, um, serve a breakfast, uh, have Sunday school, and then have an indoor traditional 10.30 service. Uh, still be very similar with a few songs and Easter message and um, that kind of thing. But uh, that was one option. The other option is just keep 8, 9, 15, and 10.30 as we've always done it and as we do it each week and not change anything. So, um, kind of a couple of things we've been kicking around. Uh, there won't be any Sunday evening uh, prayer time that night or youth or children's activities. But for Sunday morning, what do you think? Do you have a preference? Do you think anybody would show up and eat breakfast or stay around and eat breakfast to stay for Sunday school? We're not talking about anything elaborate. I'll probably get some of the ladies to make a breakfast casserole, something like that. If you have biscuits and gravy, we may have big crew, big crew turn out. <laughs> Stick around. Uh, well, if you're on Facebook tonight, you can send me an email or text me if you have an opinion or a thought. Um, but that's what we're we're thinking on. Uh, being outside, you know, we're not going to set up a full band kind of service. So if you come to the 8 o'clock and don't want to stay for the 1030, you'll get whatever whatever we give you <laughs> in terms of the music um, or songs. It probably won't be anything elaborate. Um so just know that. 
Um, so there'll be a little difference between the two services. We usually try to keep them similar, if not the same. But uh, message and main content as far as uh, communion and message will be the same. Yeah, do you want me to surprise you with what I'm going to preach on on Easter? You might be shocked. There's an empty tomb. <laughs> so that's why we have hope. There's an empty tomb. So he's not. He's not dead. He's alive. So. Just gave it all away, didn't I? Gave it away early. All right. With that, uh, join me. Uh, Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. We're doing two passages tonight. 20 uh, verses 1 through 13. And 21 uh, verse 4 through through uh, 10, through 9. So uh, we'll do them separately. Um, but again, similar conclusion that I want us to think on as we look at these two, two passages. Um, the idea of who's in charge of our lives. Uh, for whose glory do we do the things that we do? So I want to start in uh, chapter 20, verse 1. We'll read through verse 13. Since the entire Israelite community entered the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and they settled in Kedish, Miriam, uh, and Miriam died, uh, died and was buried there. Miriam was um, Moses' sister. Boy, Abraham popped in my head and I knew it was wrong and I wasn't sure my brain was going to get past it. <laughs> um, Moses' sister. So there was, uh, verse 2, there was no water for the community, so they assembled against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought us, uh, why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. They fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Take your staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield its water. You will bring out water for them from the rock and provide uh, drink for the community and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded them. Moses and Aaron uh, summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff so that abundant water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, um, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and he demonstrated his holiness to them. So the main point of this passage is not that Moses and Aaron don't get to go into the promised land. It's not that the Israelites quarreled, quarreled. Can I, am I saying that right? My North Carolina, I'm not sure if it's coming out proper. Um, where, the, where the assembly quarreled against them. Not the main point. What is the main point of this passage? Didn't believe God and, 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 and obey. Moses and Aaron didn't believe God and obey. Didn't trust him. Anybody else? So far you're wrong. You're, you're right in that it is a main point. But it's not the main point at least that I want to bring out tonight. And since I'm teaching, my main point gets to be the main point. <laughs> God's in control. Look at the very last verse of that. Verse 13. The very end of verse 13. He demonstrated his holiness to them. This passage is about the holiness of the Lord. Now, there are many factors in here that bring us to the holiness of the Lord. And there are a lot of good lessons in this. And almost every time I've ever taught this, I have focused on uh, Aaron and Moses not being obedient to the Lord. They didn't do what he said. They did what they thought was better than what he said. And I've always focused on that. And I've always thought that was the main point of this. Till today. Or till I, I began to prepare the, today's message. And, and my eyes kept getting drawn to that last phrase. 
They rebelled and quarreled with the Lord, and he demonstrated his holiness to them. Almost everything we see in Scripture should bring our minds back to the holiness of God. Back to the power of God. Back to the presence of God. Back to the person of God. Back to the character of God. Back to the nature of God. This is his story. About his undying love for his people. About his willingness to restore them. Um, and we, yeah. His mercy. Absolutely. So are there more than one lesson in this? Sure. We can start with the beginning. They're in the wilderness of Zen. And Miriam is dying. And there's no water. Problem number one. They assemble against Moses and Aaron. Now we learn in, in Matthew chapter 6 something about God. What's the, what's the big, what, what, at least one of the major lessons of Matthew chapter 6? Anybody know off the top of your head? It's the anxiety passage. What's God say about the birds of the sky? Cares for them. And, and the flowers of the field? None are clothed more beautifully. Why do we have anxiety if God loves even these simple things, how much more he loves his people? Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these other things will be given unto you. It's a passage against anxiety, right? Um, they come together and they grumble against Moses and Aaron. They didn't go to God, who's the giver of all good things. They didn't go to God who supplied their needs with manna. They didn't go to God who supplied their needs with quail. They didn't go to God who brought water, uh, uh, sweet water out of the bitter water. They didn't go to God who had brought water forth previously out of the rock. They went and grumbled and assembled against Moses and Aaron. Remember a passage, this is over in, in the Kings, um, with Elisha. And he's taking a hike up a mountain. You remember that passage? What happens is Elisha's taking his hike up the mountain. A, a school of prophets or young men. Uh, some young men come up to Elisha. And what do they say? You old bald head. And what happens to those young men? They were lunch meat for the, for, for the bears. What's the point of that? Leave the bald head guys alone. Spoken like a, like, 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 like a, like a true recipient. Uh, uh, God's anointed and appointed are not for men to come against. How many times has God affirmed Moses as his anointed and appointed? The assembly is not to come against them. Especially when they're right. Most often when you get in a situation where things aren't working out the way you want them to, what's really happening? God's growing you, isn't he? God's giving you an opportunity to see him in a new light, in a new way. More often than not, God's using your experience for his glory. He demonstrated his holiness to them. But rather than allow God to get glory, they start grumbling against Moses and Aaron and some of the things they say, we recognize as kind of crazy. What's up, guys? If we only had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord, we would have been better off falling the hole back at Mount Sinai than being in the presence of God, being on a journey with God. You know, a difficult journey with God, I think, is far better than falling in a hole to your death, especially when it's because of your sin nature and your sinfulness. And you're being cast out. And those people have no place in God's eternity in heaven. But that's what they first claim. Second, why have you brought us uh, 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 the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Well, he didn't bring you to, there, there's a lie in this. There's a lie in this. He didn't bring you here to die. He brought you here to enter the promised land. But you are going to die in the wilderness if you, if you were over 20, but way back yonder. Because only those under 20 get to go into the promised land of the original group because of sin. 
So you're not dying out here because God doesn't love you and didn't care for you and didn't want to treat you well. You're dying out here because you rejected God's gift. Same thing in the New Testament, isn't it? Dying separated from God is because of a rejection of God's gift, isn't it? That's what we're taught. The rejection of the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The, the rejection of the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. So they, they're, they're, they're blaming God for something that God didn't do to them. They did it to themselves. Why have you brought us here to kill us? Well, I didn't. I brought you here to bless you, but you rejected my blessing. Verse 5. Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Well, is the Canaan land an evil place? No. It's evil because they're not getting what they want. It's like when your kid tells you you're the meanest parent that's ever walked the face of the earth. Sue, were you ever the meanest parent that walked the face of the earth? Wow. You were? Okay, good. Beth was. <laughs> When's the last time? Never mind. <laughs> you know, it, is it true? Only in that moment in that child's mind, because as soon as they scrape their knee, who are they running to? The meanest parent on the face of the earth. And when daddy's mad at them coming after them with the switch, who are they running to? The meanest parent on the face of the earth. Protect me, protect me. The Israelites here whining and whimpering about how horrible God is. But God said nothing but take care of them. It's not an evil place. It's just they're not getting their way and they're mad. And then they say it's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates. And there's no water to drink. Well, Guess what? You're in the desert because you failed to go in. The 12 spies brought out on a, on a po pole uh, grapes that were too heavy for a man to carry by himself. And you looked at him and said the land is not good for us. Actually, they said the land is good, but we're too scared to do what God told us to do. And so they rejected God. It's not that the land doesn't produce what God promised it would produce. It's that they're not in the land God promised them because they rejected God. So the people are belly aching because they're in a mess that they created. But they're blaming God. Actually, at this point, they're blaming Aaron and Moses. They've assembled against them. And God, you did this to us. And there's no water to drink. Well, how many other times in the desert, and I don't know the number, you might, have they been thirsty and God provided for them? They found an oasis. Well, they, I do know the number. It's more than we can count. Because every time they took a drink, God provided for them. Even if it wasn't the miraculous out of a stone, God still provided it, right? So God's been in the business of providing for them the whole trip. Now Moses and Aaron, they, get, they do what they're supposed to do. When the assembly gathers against you, what are you supposed to do? You go to God. You pray. They went to the tabernacle. To the entryway. Why do you think they prayed in the entryway instead of go, Moses going inside? I got a thought on that. The assembly is there bringing accusations. If they go inside, they'll get a private word from God. They're hoping to get a public word from God. God will affirm us in this. That's what I think is happening. I think that's why it happened the way it happened. Um, very good. Um, so they, verse 6 is where you get that. Uh, they went to the presence of, uh, from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And they fell face down. It's interesting too. Because what happens if you fall face down before the Lord. And the Lord doesn't show up. So what they're doing is they're humbling themselves in faith, believing God will affirm their, 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 their seeking of him. That he will affirm their leadership among the Israelites. They took a risk by doing this. So the, the, the tabernacle is always outside the actual camp. It's on, and so they would have left where they were assembled as a camp. The people would have followed them, at least somewhat. 
No, no. Um, good question. Aaron may not have survived the presence of God. Good, uh, Paul. Paul uh, um, the, every time Moses would go, would go into the tent of meeting, the presence of God would be so strong, so bright, that he would come out and have to cover his face because the people would fear him because of his ra the radiance of God had rubbed off on him. Aaron may not have been able to survive it. You know, so maybe that, that's why they, they stopped outside as well. The other thing is God's presence may have already been lighting up the place. And so they stopped there uh, just in awe or reverence. Uh, so there are some, some, some other ways to, to think about it. The reality is when they fell face down, the glory of the Lord appeared. And the Lord spoke. It's interesting. The glory of the Lord appeared to them, but the Lord spoke to Moses. They both got to see or, or the expression of the glory of the Lord, probably the cloud or the light. But the voice of the Lord was speaking to Moses, which is the same as it was on the mountaintop. Aaron shows up. God speaks to Moses. Moses tells Aaron what God said. Aaron tells the people. There was a, 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 a uh, order uh, of roles and, and, and responsibilities and, and uh, um, closeness. So take the staff and assemble the community and speak to the rock. You know, if, if God does ever speak to you directly, pay attention to the words he says. I'm not very good at this. My wife, not she is not God, but my wife tells me things all the time. And I hear what I want to hear, what I think is right. Not necessarily what she says. Am I the only husband that does that? Probably not. We always laugh at my dad. My, my, my dad, uh, um, he likes to read signs going down the highway. But he only reads the first letter or two of signs. And then he makes up the rest of it. And he's always getting stuff wrong because he doesn't pay enough attention. I'm my father's child. I often find myself doing that. But there is importance in the details, isn't there? And if you're not a detail person, you know what you need in your life? A detail person. Allison's a detail person. I'm not. She helps me a lot. Um, you know, in church, at work, and administration, and activity, I need detail people around me. I'm, I feel like I, my gift is more in the leading and, and the communicating and the, the, the friending but the details, they're difficult to me. You know, did you pack enough sandwiches? I don't know. Enough balls of water? I don't know. Who's responsible for getting it? I don't know. That's my wife's job. That's somebody else's job. My job is to make sure that when people show up, they get talked to. We all have different roles. But when God speaks to you, you need to hear clearly what he says. What was the problem in the Garden of Eden with Satan and Eve and their conversation? Did God really say what Satan said, God said? God said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What did Satan say? You couldn't touch it or eat it. Satan twisted the words just a little bit. What starts happening when you twist the scripture? Even a little bit. You get out of alignment, don't you? Once you get out of alignment, what happens? Problems. Causes all kinds of problems, side effects. So when Moses and Aaron go before the assembly, instead of speaking to the rock, what do they do? Verse uh, 11. Raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Not just once, but he double tapped it. Those of you gum people, you'll enjoy that statement. Um, he double tapped it. And water came gushing out. Now God still gave him water, didn't he? It's still a miracle. 
but it's not what God said to do. Sometimes we still get God-sized results when we don't do it God's way. But what we feel, fail to realize is when we don't do it God's way, we suffer consequences of sin. Because anything that's not His way is sin. Even if He chooses to bless it. Was God bound in covenant with, Abra uh, with Moses to bring water out of that rock when He tapped it? No. He was only bound to do what he had already promised he would do. You speak to the rock, I'll bring out water. That's a covenant. You trust me and you do what I ask, I'll do what I promise. When Moses tapped it, the covenant was broken. God's no longer accountable to bring water out. Larry, you had your hand up. Yeah, God still delivered, which is God's option. So what's the consequence? Moses and Aaron don't get to come into the promised land. So that's a pretty big disobedience, isn't it? Not from a, it is, but not from a human perspective, though. Seriously, God? All this stuff I've done for the last... 40 years with the Israelites and now just because I hit the rock twice, I don't get to go? Well, what by definition is sin? Disobedience. Does it matter if it's a little disobedience or big disobedience? Sin is sin. and Sin separates. God wants what from us? Simple obedience. Even in the little things. And it's not easy. <laughs> carry, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> I thought it was Yosemite Sam I want to start with your first statement. What was it? Say that again. Yeah. So the first statement was, was um, both were good. But first, I want to start with the first one. Um, the people thought if they complained, they would get what they asked for. I wonder sometimes, I'm, I'm, I know I'm guilty about this. How much we encourage the squeaky wheel to squeak by continuing to put oil on it. Rather than teach it new behavior. I, I know I'm guilty of that more often than not because I don't like conflict. And if I can grease the wheel and not have conflict, I grease the wheel. But if, if you grease the wheel every time it squeaks, guess what? It's going to keep on squeaking. Even louder. And the Israelites have done this. And they probably have learned an unintentional lesson. Uh, of If we complain, Moses will go to God and God will fix it for us. <laughs> like a cat. You know, they train their humans. Yeah, cats are good about training their humans. Um, so, so it is. It's a challenge um, to, to make sure that we're hearing God. We're honoring God. And we're teaching right behavior. I wonder, and, and I think he did try to teach this through the desert in different situations and scenarios. But I wonder why that never took. Hey guys, instead of coming and complaining and assembling against me, why don't we just make a suggestion or ask a question rather than grumble? Hey Moses, uh, have you thought about this? Have you worked on this yet? Um, has anybody else brought this to you? You know, there's right ways and wrong ways to present issues and struggles. Um, there's millions of them. But it doesn't really change. 
Well, more often than not, that's exactly. They, they start grumbling to each other rather than going to the source that can fix it. Well, starting with the source of God or, or taking it to... So the way the Israelites were split up was there were, they were managers over the tens and the fifties and the hundreds. And, you know, so there was this uh, pyramid and it may have been an issue of somebody not doing their job down below, you know, and, and, and uh, it not being taken care of right. So, um, good, good, good point. Um, let's don't forget. And how are the Israelites led through the wilderness? Pillar of cloud and fire. So everywhere they are, God took them there. They're not just we uh, wandering in the desert or wandering in the wilderness in the sense of of a blindfold and they're lost and don't know where they're going. They're exactly where God has placed them. We don't want to miss that as a foundational point. Because if we miss that, then we miss the opportunity God has given them to see his glory. And he's sanctifying them. He is teaching them lessons through the desert. And one of those lessons is, if I put you here, I know where you are. And if I put you here where there's no water, I've got a plan. And if you don't know my plan, either you're not being patient enough or you're not opening your eyes enough or you're not spending enough time with me to figure it out. But there's a lot of different ways we can address that particular lesson. But there's a lesson. The lesson now is they've assembled against Moses. The Lord has spoken to Moses and he's going to provide water. But he has them exactly where he wants them to be. That's a good point. Yeah. So, where is God? He's everywhere. So, when we say that, that's, that's the right answer. That's the answer I was looking for. That's a pretty generic answer. So Larry's sitting at the back by Polly. I'm up here at the front. Is is God beside you? Not no, not that God is Polly. But so there's a, there's a hole between them. They made room for Jesus tonight. And so uh is is God close to Larry? Yes. Is God close to me? Is God closer to me or closer to Larry? He's within each one. <laughs> Since Paulie's back there, there is more of the presence of God back there. This is true. My parents are in South Carolina right now, and God is with them. So, is God closer to them in South Carolina or closer to me in Indiana? Well, as a, as a good Tar Heel, I would say since he painted the sky Carolina blue, you know, and then being in South Carolina, he'd be closer to the Tar Heels. But that, the reality is when we say he's everywhere, he really is everywhere equally. He's equally close to me as he is to Larry and Polly back there. And he's equally as close to my parents in South Carolina as he is to me in Indiana. And there's no differentiation. If he's on the furthest star that we can see and he's on Earth... He's still everywhere, equally at the same time. This is a huge concept. It just kind of blows my mind to think about this. Because we say he's everywhere, but do we really act like it? Do we really live it out? 
when you start thinking about sanctification and holiness, and, and to the final point and the main point of this 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 particular passage, um, uh, the, uh, these are these are the waters of Meribah. This uh, is where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and He demonstrated His holiness to them. We find God's holiness wherever God is. So God's holiness is everywhere. And we need to be experiencing his holiness everywhere. It's a mindset. It's an image. It's also the idea of the physical realm and the spiritual realm being equally as real. We only think about the things we can touch, feel, see as being real. But God's just as real in the spiritual realm as he is in the physical realm. And he's working because he's everywhere. Unlimited. Um, so when the Israelites are crying out in the desert, we have no water. Guess what? His holiness is there. Ahead of them. With them. And upon them. He's there. All they got to do is figure out how to experience his presence. Moses has learned this lesson. Because what does Moses do when he's in either in doubt or in question or in need? He goes to the tabernacle. Not because of the building or the location. He goes to the tabernacle because that's where he meets up with who? With God. And it's not that God's more present in the tabernacle than he is on the side of the mountain. Or on the top of the mountain. It's Moses has learned. The most valuable part of his existence. Is the time he spends with God. There's holiness in that. And I think. Back to the idea of sanctification. God wants to sanctify us. Which means make us saints. Make us holy. Make us pure. And he's trying to use these different situations with the Israelites in the wilderness, the desert, to bring them into his presence. To sanctify them. To teach them his ways. Bud made another good point in what he said earlier was, we, have to, we also need to remember back, where did the Israelites come from? Egypt. What were they? Slaves. What are they going to be in the Canaan land? Free. Free people need to learn how to behave, how to trust God. They were very rigid in Egypt. They didn't have a lot of freedoms. What happens to somebody who hasn't had a lot of freedoms and all of a sudden they get a lot of freedoms? Go to any college campus or spring break, right? They, they go through a season. How many of us at some point in our life, young adult life, got out from under mom and daddy's arms, hands, and we had a little experience of life in a bad way. And then had to get right with God again because we didn't know how to handle the freedom. The Israelites need to learn how to handle this freedom. Absolutely. The law is there to guide us, to put up, to put up uh, um, direction for us, to, to keep us from harming ourselves. But the law only works if the law is kept. Unfortunately, they keep violating the law. What's commandment number one of God's top ten? God is first. There are no other gods before me. What's the Israelites' number one problem in sin? God is not first. Water's first. What's, what's Jesus say about thirsting? If I am the living water. I am. It's another one of those I am comments. We're preaching on I am Sunday. And I am number five. I am the living water. If you drink of me, you will never thirst again. Remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai the second time? How long was he there? Without food and water. Forty days. Did he thirst? We're not told that he did. He came down that mountain. He wasn't looking for water. He was looking to express the word of God. To deliver it. The Israelites are a few days out of water. 
And what are they thirsting for? Moses and Aaron's head on a platter. They are not thirsting for righteousness. They are not thirsting for God's presence. They are not thirsting for um, his arrival. But Moses falls face down. He's thirsting for the presence of God in the midst of trial. What's God prepare for you? Or prepare, yeah, what's God prepare for you? A table. Where? The presence of mine enemies. Moses and Aaron just laid down in the presence of their enemies. They weren't worried. Because God was there. God spoke to him. I'm not going to get into 21. We'll do 21 next week. I promised snakes this week. We'll get into snakes next week. Deacons are going to have to hold them one more week. <laughs> We're not that kind of Baptist. Um, so what's, the, what, what's God's greatest desire for us to recognize maybe about him? His holiness. What's his greatest desire for us? To become holy. We need to be sanctified. If we're Moses, we need to pay attention to the individual words of God. He said it. He means it. We don't get to do it our way without consequences. Even if he chooses to bless us in the midst of doing it the wrong way. Allison made supper last night. I'm going to pick on her. Y'all ever do the, uh, the frozen vegetables where you have to put them in the microwave and follow the directions? Sometimes, you know, because they're not all exactly the same, so you don't do them all exactly the same way. You know what happens when you grab the vegetables and you do it the way the other package says instead of the way the package says that you got? You get crunchy vegetables. Actually, they turned out really good. I was shocked. And so was she because she said these are going to be really hard, and they weren't. You know, even sometimes when you do it wrong, you get it right. But there's consequences. With God, there's always consequences. He brought the water out of the rock. He, he, he met the people's need. He got glory for himself in holiness, which was ultimately his goal. But poor Moses got to die before he goes into the promised land. He don't get to go because he didn't listen to God. Vegetables won't kill you even if you cook them wrong, I think. They're still good. Illustration breaks down at some point, right? We need to seek his holiness. He's everywhere. And everywhere the Israelites were was exactly where he took them to teach them something. So let me tell you, wherever you are is somewhere God has brought you to to teach you something. Not a bad point from the wilderness. But we do need to recognize who's in control. Who is it? God. Every step of the way. Fire by night. Pillar of cloud by day. He took them where he wanted them to be. To teach them what he wanted to teach them. I'm done eight minutes early. But I'm not going to do the snakes. So questions, thoughts, comments. If not. I'm going to let Paul get his music stuff started early. Alright. Thanks for being with us tonight. We will see you again Sunday morning. And we'll get our Easter schedule out to you probably first Sunday for those of you who are here uh, and publish uh, first of the week on, uh, for website and other online stuff um, as far as what time our services will be. There would definitely be a 1030 service. There would definitely be Sunday school at 915. Those are on. Uh, we'll let you know what time the early service will start. If we're going to do something sunrise or if we're just going to do traditional. We'll get information out to you Sunday, first of the week. Uh, we'll publish all that. I don't think I have any other announcements. Oh, I think I told you I'd to give you VBS week. It is the week of June, I think it's the 14th. So it'll be Monday through Friday. So if I haven't already told you that, uh, we'll be doing in-person VBS that week. Love for you to be here as a leader. Love for you to be here with kids. Love for you to be here as a servant. Uh, so we, we're looking forward to doing VBS this year in person. So, all right. I think that's all I have for you. Have a great night. Oh, let me pray for you. And then you can have a great night. Father, we love you and we thank you again for, for, for the opportunity to study your word together. I thank you for the truth of your word. 
But Father, let it be our goal, not just to learn, but to experience your presence. Reveal to us your holiness, your truth, and your call on our lives. The daily direction that you'd have us to travel. The wisdom of the situations of life that we encounter. May we grow in our faith, in our trust, in our experience with you. And may you be glorified through each one of us. Shine your light. Help us to follow. Be glorified among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week, guys. And we look forward to seeing you next chance we get.